Greetings, everyone, and welcome uh, to the fifth webinar, part of the Schulich School of Business's webinar series on shaping the post-pandemic world. My name is Preet Aulak, and I'm the Associate Dean of Research at Schulich. I'll be hosting the webinar and moderating the question and answer sessions. So now it gives me great pleasure uh, in introducing our speaker today, uh, Dr. Moshe Farjan, who is a professor of strategy at the Schulich School of Business. Professor Farjan has been researching and teaching on strategy in turbulent environments for more than 20 years. In 2005, he co-authored an influential book, Organization at the Limit, that extracted managerial lessons from the 2003 NASA's Columbia shuttle disaster. He has subsequently involved in an academic think tank on early warning systems and a joint NASA-sponsored think tank on the development of complex engineering systems. He's currently working on a new book on strategic surprises in the mobile computing industry. He's thus the ideal person to talk about strategy in upheaval. The screen is yours, Moshe. Thanks for joining in and for the organizers for their hard work. Today's session is going to be about uh, business and organizational strategy, and it's going to be structured into two segments. The first segment, we're going to answer the question of what's going on and provide a big picture view of the uh, COVID-19 upheaval. We're going to follow by questions and answers, ideally related to uh, what is going to be discussed in that segment. Second segment is going to zoom in on strategy, and then we'll be followed with questions and answers as well, and then we'll have some concluding comments. I expect not all questions to be answered because of the time limits. So while I appreciate the discussion, I also offer you a way to continue the dialogue with uh, what you see at the bottom of the screen, a dedicated email, and also a post on LinkedIn inviting your reactions. Also, I drew in preparing this uh, seminar on a wide range of sources. I want to give credit to everybody, but if you need some particular references, do not hesitate to contact me. I'd like to dedicate this webinar to my late colleague, uh, Brenda Zimmerman. Sadly, she's not with us today, but she would have a lot to contribute to this uh, webinar series by her great expertise. To start with, just uh, imagine these three astronauts coming back from space not too long ago. They were away for several months. In this, this few months, the unimagined has happened. So let's join them as they make sense of what transpired in the world and in business. For that purpose, we're going to look at several lenses useful to understand the ongoing pandemic and the recession that's coming with it. The first one, going from the uh, bottom left, is going to be a lens of a wild card, a surprise, a certain. The second one above it is going to give us a sense of a revolution, an upheaval, creative destruction, if you like. The third one is to view this event as a grand challenge. And the fourth one is a transformational learning experience. So let's start with a wild card. The wild card is really another name for a genuine strategic surprise, something that is low probability, high impact. Um, obviously, a lot of what happened happened suddenly, and it caught most systems unaware and unprepared. We're talking about businesses, we're talking about government, medical organizations, and so on. We're facing a hidden, evasive enemy, and this enemy is not open to negotiation. And it continues to evolve in unexpected ways, sometimes in surreal ways. Think about recent oil prices. There's a deep uncertainty going on. So on the one hand, uncertainty is pervasive. It cuts across many areas. It starts with the virus. We don't know that much about it. Responses, recession and recovery timing, and so on. Particularly important are the so is the social part. How do government decision makers, strategies respond to this uncertainty? But also the long-term implications are, are very unclear. Uh, as well, this uncertainty may interact with other developments, uh, and this is something of, of great significance. On the other hand, not everything is uncertain. By now, we know already several things. Uh, we, it seems that we are past the peak. The center of gravity gradually shifts to recession. We also know that novelty is expected at least for a year. And we also know that most likely we're going to see uh, a whole 
new set of technologies coming in. So just take uh, one example of how deep uncertainty affects a particular uh, organization. Lonely Planet of all, of all firms uh, and their guided books business. I'm particularly attracted to this example because unfortunately I planned a family vacation to the Canadian Rockies and in February I bought one of these guides. Oh well. So Lonely Planet suffered before the pandemic. And uh, now it, it has to deal with all kinds of uncertainties. Nature of travel, what's going to happen with tourism, and how are they going to survive all that? The second lens to look at these things is through a lens of revolution. So here we have uh, a sense of creative destruction. And this goes through two different mechanism. One is the churn, the entry and exit of firms, and the other is the adaptation, adaptation of existing firms. This uh, occurs mainly through a great reshuffling and value migration from businesses to businesses, and particularly from existing to new industries. As a result of all this, the environment is highly malleable and opens for renegotiation of all kinds. Also, reversal of fortunes is prevalent and highly expected. A lot of firms are going to lose wealth, and some of them are going to face ex existential threat or facing that already. But also on the bright side, huge opportunities for foreigners, for newcomers, startups, but sometimes also for the incumbents. Not all of these developments are going to be in terms of reversal. Some of them are actually going to just uh, dramatize existing tendencies and accelerate what we saw uh, just before the pandemic uh, started. So this revolution can be viewed in several examples. Uh, on the top, you can see two uh, more fortunate businesses, uh, robots for cleaning in supermarkets, augmented reality. Uh, in both cases, lots of new opportunities. And then uh, less fortunate, we see EasyJet here in the airline industry. The cruise industry, a symbol of this pandemic, is now highly stigmatized and obviously is going to suffer uh, very uh, direct consequences. And finally, a recent startup, uh, Bell Scooters, who is not doing well in this period as well. The third lens is a transformational learning experience. So if, look around. Learning is widespread from our immune system to the national level, to the international domain. And learning here occurs in rapid, very rapidly and in real time. On occasions, we have some lag that provides some learning opportunities because industries are not affected at the same time, countries are not responding in the same time, so one can learn from the other. And learning occurs mainly through events, not from the events. Also, there's rampant experimentation because this context is very unfamiliar, very uncertain. Uh, we see all kinds of experiments going on, and some businesses are writing their own textbooks. We also see massive change of habits, and experimentation is something that helps that, because now we see people trying new things, and a lot of businesses can gain from that. Also, the longer we have this pandemic, the longer the recession, the more established are going to be some of the new habits. Not everything is going to change, but a lot is going to change. On the dark side, some of the learning processes are complicated because systems operate near or beyond their limits. They have low margins of error. And as a result, some lessons remain unheeded and not fully absorbed. Whereas the difference between Italy was slow to respond and Canada, who did much better by learning from the SARS uh, uh, pandemic. And finally, grand challenge. And grand challenges are characterized by uh, crossing the boundaries, multidisciplinary problem solving. They require cooperation of all levels and all, all aspects. This is not purely economic problem. This is not purely medical or social problem. And firms play a key role in problem solving efforts. And because we are talking about new order, the political dimension is key. First, there's a short-term context of government stimulus funds. We see that uh, all the time. But more so, in the long term, there's going to be a major struggle to narrate and shape the new order. So several implications for this segment for business and strategy. First of all, the impact is uneven. There's no single recipe for any business. 
It's also contradictory. We see change, but we also see continuity. We see a threat, but also an opportunity. Some people may say that if there ever was a stress test, stress test for good business, this is it. Arguably, the very best time to be a strategist. Why? Because in hard times, you have to focus on the essence of the business, of your competitive advantage. Also, you have ample opportunities for strategizing, an occasion for reinventing the company and implementing changes uh, long awaited. So coming next after, after our first Q&A, uh, we're gonna discuss other issues. We already discussed sense making, and then uh, other areas where strategies are involved are gonna be the, the following three. Uh, conducting a comprehensive audit, approaching uncertainty mindfully, and crafting, creating a flexible strategies. So this is the time to turn to you for question and answers on this segment, please. Do you see a revert to the old normal or the emergence of a new normal? It has two parts. One is the old normal and the other is the new normal. Well, some would say that the old normal was not normal to begin with. On the second part, I think that a lot of things are gonna remain the same, but many things are gonna look very differently. So I would say it's more like a spiral. On one dimension, it constantly repeats itself, but on other dimensions, it moved to completely new arrangements. Question from uh, Ashwin Joshi, uh, who asks uh, whether it's the worst time to be a strategist, in that a, failing, <laughs> a falling tide sinks all boats. It's not the worst. I don't think that, uh, first of all, we have to understand the strategist is not one person. Firms uh, conduct the, the, the strategies and develop them by involving many people uh, from different levels in the organizations. Uh, middle managers, for instance, are known for developing experiment, new experimental uh, strategies. So I think uh, they have a lot to uh, show in these times. But other than that, uh, in terms of uh, the act of strategizing, I think this is uh, one context where you can see it uh, most impactful. Uh, on the other hand, I do agree that uh, a lot of managers and leaders are dealing with uh, issues of uh, stabilizing their, their businesses and so forth. But as I'm gonna, as I'm gonna uh, suggest, uh, sooner or later, they need to think about long-term strategy. And, and in fact, thinking about long-term strategy is actually gonna help them making better decisions on the short run. There's a question from uh, Radhika Sanja who uh, wants to know uh, whether, uh, which of the four lenses to see COVID, like the wild call revolution and so on that you have identified, which are the most relevant and does it shift as we get updates on where things are going? I can think about priorities, prioritizing them because I think in some respect they are overlapping. On the other hand, I would say that the element of surprise and uncertainty is gradually gonna moderate. And uh, we're gonna see two things. One is uh, more of the, the revolution part in terms of uh, reversal of fortunes. And also we're gonna see the, the shaping involved. So if I have to uh, quickly rank them, I would say that more for, the first to be to be more more central would be the wild card. Then it's gonna take a, a little bit turn into more of the uh, the challenge of of combating the virus uh, and so on. But then also in the longer run, there's gonna be a lot of struggle to redefine the new order. Uh, both at the industry and the economy level. There's a question from Taslima Rashid. Uh, she asks, uh, uh, strategy is about formulating the path to an agreed goal based on facts and assumptions. Why is it that there is not much importance being given to environmental sustainability as a key factor to building our, post, our future post-pandemic? Well, uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a valid point. I obviously cannot in this short time uh, of presentation cover all aspects of strategy. I do think that the social dimension is, is uh, very important and we, we saw at least one presentation uh, discussing that. I would also touch a little bit later on that because I'm gonna argue that we need to take a wider lens on what's going on 
sometimes taking our eyes a little bit from the pandemic and observing other major developments such as the climate change. Actually, you know, when I'm looking at these questions, uh, a lot of them are also related to what can be done, how to respond. Okay. So I would suggest at this time to move on to the second uh, part and maybe uh, these questions can come up when we discuss that, uh, go to that Q&A. Sure. Thank you all for your, uh, your questions. And now we're going to turn for the second segment and uh, zoom in on, on strategy. So you can see from this uh, slide, taking from completely different context, I kind of turned it into a strategic dialogue during an uh, unusual time. This is actually uh, a management meeting in an uh, Italian museum. So maybe a likely topic, strategy and upheaval right here. So let's zoom in on strategy and see uh, what uh, lessons we can derive here. As I mentioned before, stabilization and short-term initiatives are the main preoccupation of most leaders now, and for good reasons. But I think that attention to strategy is required too. And as I mentioned, and I give some examples, I think that attention is not a luxury, and in fact, does not contradict the attention to short-term initiative and sometimes can help get them as well. So let's look how. We talk about three different roles for strategies. Obviously, these are not everything that can be done, but given what I covered so far, they are particularly relevant. One is about conduction of a brave audit. A second one is a more mindful approach to uncertainty. A third one is about uh, developing creative and flexible strategy. So let's start uh, one by one. So the first stack is really a back to basics exercise, but maybe at this period of time, it requires more courage, more concentrated efforts and so forth. And it involves several things, but one of the main ones is to ask good questions and get honest answers to questions such as, what aspects of the environment are likely to newly appear? reappear or disappear? What are the key implications for the new environment for established assumptions and historical strengths? And what is not likely to change in the foreseeable future? So let's take one example. This is from uh, Disney. Obviously a company highly dependent on social and physical proximity through theme parks, cruise lines, and so forth. But few media companies have been hit harder by the pandemic. And uh, interestingly enough, their CEO was about to leave the company, publish his autobiography and so, but he was called back. And now he's focusing his effort on remaking the company. And that company is gonna look very, very different. Fewer employees, more emphasis on safety, and you can imagine other things as well. This case exemplifies the uh, pervasiveness of the pandemic. In this case, for a corporate strategy, a diversified company, and a company highly dependent on the content production, both in TV and in film. For this reason, the case illustrates several other interesting uh, things about, about the audit. One is that in, in this case, we see a clear reversal of the key strengths of the company because their major business, their flagship of uh, of uh, content production, which supports all the other businesses, was, is, is badly hurt. We also see another lesson here that there's uneven impact on different businesses because, uh, for instance, for Disney, we see that uh, Disney Plus, the streaming service, is actually doing quite well. So that's something that uh, we need to figure out when we do an audit to do it across different levels all the way to particular activities within the company. And finally, I think that what we see here uh, can be called a zip strategy in reference to zip files, uh, because what happens here is that the company shrinks like a zip file would shrink, compresses itself to its minimal viable core, so to speak, uh, with the option to expand and to pivot uh, in the future as conditions are gonna change. Another lesson or principle here for this uh, productive audit is really for companies to think resources and capabilities, not just products and markets. And this is sometimes not very intuitive for many companies. Many, many of us identify companies with what they actually do, the services, the products, and so on. But in fact, 
when you step back and look at their underlying resources and capabilities, you start looking at the companies in terms of their potentials. And those potentials can lead them to many unexpected directions. As we see from the example here, Ford Motors uh, produces oxygen masks out of their F-150 truck, and there are plenty of other examples. A lot of what's going on here is that is a recombination of different skills and capabilities and routines within the firm down to the level of uh, particular individuals. So you can actually look at the individual not just as, as a person, but also as a combination of different skills, relationship, and so on that can be put to different uses and recombined to produce new outcomes and applications. And uh, this mechanism will actually played out by several entrants to the pandemic related fields. We can see here from this chart that different firms uh, start entering into different aspects of the uh, pandemic from tracing to uh, testing, diagnostics, to treatment such as ventilators. And a lot of effort is obviously dedicated to developing vaccination. And then we have downstream opportunities, digital, healthcare, home computing and work. In all of that, we see both existing diversified firms entering these businesses, but also many startups that take on these opportunities. The second role for strategies that I see here very central in this pandemic is to approach uncertainty uh, more mindfully. And when I say mindfully, I refer to the fact that many managers uh, sometimes ignore uncertainty or just try to explore from past trends into the future, but this is not business as usual. And for this reason, you need a more mindful approach. We try to identify uh, more precisely different critical uncertainties in the company's environment. One exercise that I do with my students is to imagine a crystal ball where as a CEO, you need to relay two or three most critical questions about the future. And hopefully with the answer to those questions, try to move forward. So this is one way to think about what critical uncertainty means. It has to be related to the key strategic decision that the company is about to make. But also focusing just on COVID-19 may not be uh, prudent, Uh, because there are other developments that may be uh, as central, if not most central. So it's really an issue of managing attention, not just human or financial resources, but managing the scarce managerial attention. You can just imagine how this pandemic would look like if we will face a breakdown of communication networks because of overload or maybe even even worse, uh, some cyber attacks or something of that sort the whole experience, the whole crisis is going to develop drastically in different ways. And we cannot ignore that. So strategies need to consider move that we apply to qualitatively different scenarios to try to think about these moves as keeping them in the picture, regardless of how the scenarios are going to unfold. And the key principle here is really to balance commitment and flexibility. So on one hand, you need to have some way to think about your competitive advantage, differentiate, and so forth. On the other hand, you want to still be in the game regardless of how things are going to develop in other scenarios. I move now to the third role, which really builds on the first two. So it both builds on, the, on a good, good and brave audit, but also on how you mindfully approach uncertainty. So let's take a, a look at Dyson here as an example. And uh, Dyson, uh, known for its uh, vacuum cleaner, is really uh, also known for its design engineering skills. And that's one of the best way for them to differentiate the strategy and to have competitive advantage against uh, various rivals. What we see recently with Dyson was uh, first the entry, the failed entry in a sense to electric cars, but now we see them moving into medical equipment as well. It looks like The company is failing in some time, but also on the other hand, one can look at what they do as really engaging in relatively low cost experiments and a way for them to probe radically different futures, whether it's uh, in the field of healthcare, in mobility and so on. Even if they fail, the new skills and alliances that they develop can make them more competitive in the uh, post-pandemic environment 
whether in its existing business or in the new, newly developed ones. Another example of an idea, if you like, about developing flexible and creative strategy is the notion of an incomplete approach. And this is needed because strategies really need to transcend different timescales from the short term to the medium term to the long term. And therefore, they need a more open-ended and evolvable strategy. And uh, if you think about it, in Cubism, the artistic movement here on the right, the artists really start drawing with only a vague idea of the end point. So this is not the classic approach of having a, a foolproof design before you start acting. And we can see something like that at Apple as well in the digital, uh, digital strategy 2004 document. Um, it was far-sighted, but still incomplete. And in a sense, it reminds of the periodical table holistic approach, but filled with some holes. And these qualities guided Apple towards a broad, a vulnerable, and as we know, a rosy future. And two other examples here. One is about creative solutions in the hospitality business. We see here a new segment dedicated to luxury Corona hotels. And on the right side, we see some uh, experimentation in beach solutions in Italy. So this is the time for question and answers on the, this segment, and if you like, on the presentation as a whole. So we have a question from Isabella uh, Pantos, who asks, what can we learn from historical recessions and apply to the COVID impact with the information we know today? What mo models can best work to have the economy moderate and bounce back? I prefer to leave it to Matthias Kipping, who is going to give a more historical overview. But I think that there are some parallels uh, between what we see now and previous discontinuities, all the way from uh, the dot-com, September 11, if you like, the 2008 recession. I think what we see in these circumstances is that, as I mentioned, there's going to be a lot of experimentation. Uh, many firms are focusing on retrenchment, but many others are trying to uh, move on to uh, innovation, diversification uh, as well. And their success is going to vary, vary depending on different businesses and so on. So I think that given this deep uncertainty, I would be hesitant to be more precise about it. But I would also say that history rhymes. It doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So it's not true that we cannot derive any lessons. But we need to be very careful about uh, what analogies we, we use. The ideal approach, in my view, is to use multiple analogies and try to extract only the parallels uh, to this particular pandemic. Uh, there's a question from Aaron Chi. Uh, the question is, the strategist in us needs to figure out what those better things are. Do you have any insight specifically into the good side of this pandemic? Okay, so silver lining, uh, we can see it in different domains. First of all, as I uh, showed in one of the slides, there are tremendous opportunities within the COVID pandemic from different aspects of this, uh, this business. Actually, it's a multi billion business, if you like it. And also, of course, at the, uh, the post-pandemic post development we're going to see in, in, in other domains. There's some evidence for lots of opportunities. And we know from similar discontinuities that, that these times of uncertainty and upheaval are actually the most important for new and, and big businesses to, uh, to flourish. Uh, we have uh, some examples, for instance, Alibaba. In 2003, they were suffering very hard. Their response to, to SARS really imprinted their culture and uh, really moved them very drastically into the uh, e-commerce domain. So uh, we're going to see several newcomers, several successful firms coming up from this uh, pandemic as well. There's a question from Pam Laycock. Uh, she asked, can we actually plan long term anymore? Before COVID, innovation cycles and di disruption were coming faster and shorter. And now it's hard to even plan past the next week with any sense of forward visibility and predictability. I hear this argument all the time about uh, uh, the fast-paced fast environment as an antithesis to planning. I do not agree with that. Uh, I think fast-paced environment makes things more difficult. But I think that there are many examples of companies who strategize even in fast-paced environment. 
I don't think that in this, this pandemic, this is the major issue, the, the, the speed of it. I do think that planning should be viewed not just as predicting the future, but rather as preparing for various futures. The planning process itself has its own contribution, regardless of uh, whether the plan is right or not. And I think uh, we see many good examples of, of planning from giant firms such as Amazon and smaller startups. And these strategies and short and, and responses may not be viewed as our ideal view of what strategy is, as uh, let's say uh, 10 years projection, but they still involve the basics of thinking about your competitors, thinking about competitive advantage, thinking about your strengths and weaknesses, and so on. And I think uh, the examples are all around. Uh, so there's a question from Kanwar Preet Singh, uh, who asks, we are already seeing many industries pivoting. Designer brands making masks, automobile makers making ventilators. Uh, so the question is, how permanent will this be? And second, how important is pivoting at this point for companies to survive? I think that pivoting is important, but uh, I would say that, and that's part of the, uh, the audit that I didn't have a time, a time to uh, elaborate on, it really depends on, on how mobile are you, the different resources that you have at your stock. So uh, if you are a digital company, maybe you have more leeway in pivoting. Uh, if you are a startup, you have more leeway in pivoting. Um, if you are stuck with some fixed assets, uh, maybe less so. So it really depends. But I think we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna see more of it. The real question in pivoting, of course, uh, is really, and that gets back to, to the previous uh, question, is really not just to enter a new business, a new growth area, but you need to ask yourself, uh, am I going to have some competitive advantage there? Uh, because pivoting is not something that one company does. If there are attractive opportunities, there are going to be others who are going to try to join. And sooner or enough, there are going to be some selection in terms of who is going to survive or not. And competitive advantage uh, plays a major role in uh, sorting out the more successful and the less successful. Uh, there's a question from Paulina Pranko, uh, but I'm going to kind of paraphrase a question because it's a question related to the education sector in which all of us uh, operate. So uh, sure. the question is, you know, how, uh, what impact do you see in the short term and long term for universities uh, and the way we deliver education uh, in the short term and the long term uh, future? Several answers on, the, on that. One is that, like we saw with the Disney example, I think the pandemic cut across many aspects of universities and business schools as, as one example. For instance, it's not just about digital technology. Uh, there are some uh, universities that are highly dependent on foreign students coming from Asia and other places. So they need to rethink their entire business model. Uh, it cut across many aspects. It's already cut across hiring, uh, curriculum, and many other aspects. So I think that's one, one observation. Another observation I would say that we also, as universities, need to take a look at some analogies. For instance, museums are facing some parallels in terms of unable to deliver on their physical uh, capacities. I would say, and I hope that I'm wrong, but I would say that there are gonna be some major changes in the business models of universities. I'm thinking about business schools in particular. I can imagine, let's say, if the situation of working from home is gonna continue, I can imagine not only students coming from different places, but also faculty coming from different places around the globe. And if it goes that way, either in existing universities or in new ones that are gonna be established, then the notion of space may be much less relevant uh, in, in the university model. There's a question from Tip Malik, who asks, it seems that big companies will come out as winners since they have more resources. Mm -hmm. If we see government benefits for loans, new technology companies cannot qualify for benefits since they are startups. Obviously there is a disconnect here. How can smaller organizations who have far less resources challenge the status quo? A great question. Of course, it goes to the heart of the struggle I was talking before. Yes, I think, you, I think 
the person who asked the question is is right right on in uh, in viewing the, the the strong the strong companies getting stronger. I wish it wasn't like that. I think that uh, there is some correlation between strong being government and, and big businesses, and sometimes that comes uh, against our notion of, of what competitive markets uh, should look like. Nevertheless, I think that startups will gradually find their place in new technologies, in new markets, and so on. But I do agree with the observation that they are in, in, uh, in a great disadvantage uh, the way things are looked at. There's a question from Angela uh, Mazzo, which I paraphrase. So the question uh, relates to uh, that, you know, with a different model, companies will be using less office space in the future and allow more employees to work from home, freeing up mm-hmm. commercial real, real estate. Do you see managing the real estate becoming a strategic asset? So is the question more from the point, I understand it's more point, the point of view of the real estate business. I, I don't have specific knowledge on that on that business, but I would I would assume that uh, uh, there's going to be drastic change in how companies use their the the physical spaces. They're probably going to be uh, leaner, but that depends, of course, if this trend of uh, of working from home is going to be as we see it now. It may somehow moderate in, in coming months as uh, we we probably going to go out of it sooner or later. And uh, in that case, maybe the uh, the downside consequences are not going to be uh, that hard. There was a comment from uh, David Johnson, and this was related to some of your previous work about duality. And so he was wondering whether some of the ways to respond uh, or how... Uh, your uh, conceptions about ways to respond relate to, uh, or whether it relates to duality. Yes, of course. We need to try to avoid binary thinking. It's not about uh, threats or opportunities. It's about both. It's not about short term and long term. Uh, We need to find ways to combine them. It's not about thinking or acting. We need to act in order to learn and to work on experiments that are gonna expand our capacities. So yes, I would say that we need to find ways to think about how things relate to one another, not as, uh, as uh, dichotomies, but uh, to find some way that we can transcend these uh, dichotomies, find some hybrid ways to, to bring uh, different time horizons, different business models uh, and so forth. And obviously synthesis is a uh, is highly desirable mechanism for generating creative solutions. There's a question from Michael uh, DeLuca. I would say ask, uh, could an increased focus on core slash essence of business output result in a dramatic decrease in corporate social responsibility activity in communities? That's a, that's a real test for businesses, isn't it? Um, and the reason I'm saying that is that it really forced companies to take off uh, a potential mask that they, they were. Did they, did they look at social responsibility as, as a tax to be paid, uh, in which case they're going to rush in trying to get away from all kinds of social responsibility uh, initiative, or they actually use a more a duality approach where they saw that uh, social responsibility and, and profitability can go together, in which case I think they're going to be in good position to continue the previous social uh, initiative as well. Uh, Moshe, I'm going to ask you the last question, uh, which mm-hmm. is... Uh, kind of encapsulate some of the other questions that are uh, waiting to be answered, but we are almost out of time. And the question is, do we need to, need to rethink strategy? My brief answer is that we see many things that uh, obviously are, are still valid. So I think strategy is highly relevant. And I think that's uh, one of the themes in my presentation. But there are some differences that are in, in the specifics. I'll give you an example. For instance, we tend to think about particular sources of competitive advantage as being related to social capital, relationship, and so on. Maybe uh, this, uh, this quality is not going to be as important uh, as before. There are going to be some new sources of advantage uh, developing. So that I would say that something that uh, may come as well. Another thing is, of course, that uh, at least in our strategy classes, we tend to put uh, a lot of focus on developing uh, competitive advantage and so forth. And in this presentation, I, I emphasize that it's still important. 
But obviously, survival is important too. And a model of uh, firms trying to survive is not very similar to a model where they try to uh, outcompete their rivals uh, for the long run. So for instance, uh, uh, when you want to develop competitive advantage, parity with your rivals is not a good idea. You want to, you want to be different, you want to be better, but parity can allow you to survive. So we may see you know, potential response of firms first trying to survive and then gradually developing some uh, distinctive advantage for later on. So that would be another, another change. And the final note is, I think, the notion of disruption, which uh, I, I, I usually do not like to use because of its negative connotation. And I think it's a, it's a too narrow concept to be used in this pandemic. I think what we see uh, is, is more about transformation that, that can be taken into many directions. It can, dis- it can disrupt, it can enable, it can accelerate, it can decelerate. So there are a variety of influences and impacts involved with such a transformative event. And I think maybe uh, we need to rethink our use of this term disruption, at least in this context. Well, thanks, Moshe. I think uh, uh, it's time for you to uh, wrap up uh, and then uh, we will wrap up the, the session. My concluding comments are really getting back to our astronauts that we started with. And of course, what they gradually discover is that the world has drastically changed. And in this webinar, uh, what we try to do is to catch reality in flight. We are not trying to be conclusive. And we use different lenses to make sense of the current developments and offer some useful directions for strategies. Uh, Danish philosopher Kierkegaard suggested that the more we limit ourselves, the more resourceful we become. Time will tell whether the current crisis and the many limitations it imposes will encourage greater openness to new ideas and lead us to new heights. Thank you. Thanks, Moshe. And on behalf of everyone, that was a great and insightful presentation. And uh, so I think now it's time for us to wrap up. Uh, So I want to say a couple of things. One is introduce our next upcoming webinar on, uh, on this Thursday. Uh, consumers and COVID uh, before, during, and after. Uh, we'll be hearing from Russell Bell, who's the pro- professor of marketing and crafts food Canada chair uh, at, at Shirley. And then if you have any questions or comments regarding these seminars, about the admission process, about our programs, uh, please feel free to connect with us. So thanks, and I, I look forward to seeing uh, a lot of you in the next seminar. Thank you.